Welcome to another Visa Innovation Series webinar. Thank you all for joining online and excited to cover off today on uh, smart cities and IoT. So the topic, how IoT is unlocking new opportunities in the smart city of tomorrow. And the subsequent webinar will pick up on a few of uh, the themes and opportunities we share today, but from a much more technical point of view. So before we begin, just the standard kind of preamble on confidentiality and and disclaimer on forward-looking statements. But before we jump into the actual webinar, we're going to share a video on our newest mass transit MTT model. Contactless technology has transformed the way people shop and the way merchants operate worldwide, creating a faster way to pay for everyone. And now, Contactless Transit is revolutionizing the way we pay to travel, providing customers with a fast, frictionless experience. Today's travel networks are vast and complex, which is why transport authorities around the world are working with Visa's Contactless Transit solutions to streamline fare collection processes and improve customer journeys. Current payment systems using paper tickets or top-up cards can cause disruption and confusion. They create queues at payment points and turnstiles, resulting in inefficient, crowded stations, unhappy customers, and unnecessarily high ticketing costs for transport operators. Visa's contactless transit solutions use secure, reliable, and fast DMV technology to simplify the process by removing the need for tickets or top-up, creating fluid customer journeys and reducing chaos. And as the passenger's experience becomes simpler and more intuitive, stations operate more efficiently, Ridership goes up and ticketing costs come down, so everybody wins. There's no requirement for passengers to register with a transit operator to travel. They just turn up and ride. They can also access their receipt data online for peace of mind. This makes the Visa model ideal for local commuters, out-of-towners and international visitors alike. In fact, anyone with a contactless card. Visa's mass transit transaction model is available worldwide and can improve station efficiency and staff deployment for operators, increasing revenue, reducing costs, and improving passenger satisfaction. Every day, millions of people are paying for contactless journeys as easily as their morning coffees, thanks to Visa's mass transit transaction model. Transit operators and municipalities continue to choose Visa as their trusted partner because we understand the needs of transport networks, large and small, everywhere in the world. Visa's Mass Transit Transaction Model. Making travel better. So to begin, you know, I'll provide an overview of our approach to IoT and then dive into specifics about the smart city landscape. Many of you have likely seen this statistic before, but projections uh, are calling that over, a billion, over 20 billion devices are expected to come online by 2020. We dig a little bit deeper. The rough estimates um, follow kind of a breakdown of about 20% in the consumer electronics space, 30% from a government deployment perspective, and 50% in the enterprise and industrial. And the above categories are somewhat intentional, as I'll talk about the civic, public, and private sectors later on in the webinar. So what's driving the Internet of Things? Well, we see ubiquitous connectivity. We see adoption on the rise and the evolution of consumer preferences. And on that last note, we recently conducted a study on consumer sentiment and found some interesting takeaways. The first is that the consumer is looking for simplified payments in the mass transit and broader mobility spaces. They're also looking for increased engagement with voice assistants like Google Home or Amazon Echo. And in brick and mortar retail, they're looking for queueless or frictionless in-store commerce and also uh, personalization. So what are some of the trends that are driving mainstream IoT adoption? First, we see device functionality. So consumers are getting a lot of value out of connected devices over non-connected devices. The affordability of these devices is dropping, so the cost of the device is now accessible to the mass market, and that there's interoperability across these uh, various devices and platforms so that they can communicate to each other and unlock new services. So from an IoT use case perspective, we believe that our cardholder will demand convenience and expect their cards to facilitate new service and business models. From an innovation perspective, payments will be at the core of these new experiences, 
There are countless opportunities through the growth of Internet of Things to make payments even more immediate and convenient for consumers with connected devices. As such, our team is focused on enabling payments and other value-added services across the IoT landscape. We specifically set up five priority verticals or focus areas, the connected car, enterprise industrial, appliances, smart cities, and retail. So the statement on the slide uh, represents kind of a, a bold prediction. So we're saying, you know, we're positing kids born today likely will never possess a physical card. That is to say, by early adulthood, any form of payment credential will reside either on a device or perhaps even more simply in the cloud. Further, this is really intended to encapsulate where we've come from and where we believe we're headed. So yesterday it was physical plastic and e-commerce. Today, mobile first world, in-app or in-store through the various pays and new methods like QR codes. And tomorrow we see the opportunity with artificial intelligence, machine-to-machine -machine transactions, and then lastly, you yourself becoming the card uh, form factor, essentially, so through bio various biometric features. And how do we think through authorization and acceptance in a future that is um, projected to be like that? So with that, I'll now provide kind of an overview of our smart cities um, strategy and our approach to the market. So the UN projects that by 2050, 70% of the world's population will live in urban settings. And that statistic comes from the World Urbanization Prospects Report issued by the UN. So from one point of view, cities are rapidly expanding. So how do we account for this influx? How do we ensure equitable access to government services? What about housing, infrastructure, transportation, utilities? But it's not just good enough to ensure that the lights turn on because citizens' expectations are also shifting and they're increasingly expecting more tailored experiences from both the public and private sectors. So let's put the city operator hat on for a moment. More people expecting personalized services. I'm pretty sure I'm not ready today, but how might IoT technology and smart open data collaboration platforms help me to provide a quality level of service to the end constituent tomorrow? And that's really kind of a, a good jumping off point for understanding our approach to the overall space. So on the evolution of the city, you know, the, the below graphic kind of represents a, a paraphrased theory proposed by Daniel Dockroff, who's now the CEO of Sidewalk Labs, but was formerly deputy mayor of New York City during the Bloomberg years. He's positing that the city has gone through various points of evolution in terms of eras. So first we have the industrial era. Through an extensive rail network that connected ports to the rest of the nation, people, goods, and ideas could span distances thought unimaginable years earlier. So the city grew in both population and enterprise. And then came electrification. And electricity made it possible to light up streets, uh, introduce new methods of transit, so streetcars and subways, and open up the possibility to grow the city vertically. And then came the automobile. And as the automobile became mass market, it shaped the formation of the cities, so streets, avenues, et cetera. Zoning regulations extended to parking, and sprawl was enabled, leaving behind a hollow urban core. And today, we think that the next evolution is going to be in the Internet of Things. So ubiquitous connectivity, evolving ownership models, the gig economy, these are all forces among others that will help redefine the smart city of tomorrow. But the city finds itself at a crossroads. So from a perception perspective, cities aren't encouraged to fail fast and fail often, in contrast to the startup and tech communities. Under the scrutiny of private enterprise and ever-informed constituent bases, cities have to be extremely prudent with respect to innovation and where they place their bets. On that topic, they also are resource constraints. So cities face challenges in attracting the type of talent needed to innovate and make sense of the volumes of data that IoT creates. Studies have shown that even if they could attract the right talent, it would take in excess of one year to approve a new role and onboard the resource. In addition, regulation poses another challenge. So cities face a host of regulatory challenges when attempting to get smart. Let's ignore for a moment privacy and security considerations posed when things are always on and connected that could be several webinars in and of itself. Let's instead take an example like zoning rules regarding mandatory parking minimums. These rules were put in place when cars were still in vogue, but despite the own evolution and ownership models, we aren't seeing sweeping changes to these existing rules or mandates. Why do we need to ensure parking for a vehicle that will not be outright owned by the resident? Further, we can layer in the autonomous electric vehicle of the future that will likely be operated as part of a fleet, whether publicly or privately owned, that can run continuously 24-7 and will never need a parking spot. 
save for pickups and drop-offs. All this to say, yes, there are significant opportunities ahead of us, but equally significant challenges to overcome to ensure that a city is able to realize their smart city vision of the future. So I'm, I've taken this quote from Stefano Lin from HB from a recent study called Citizen Next, and he goes to say, it's not enough to be citizen-centric in the age of digital disruption. Public sectors must be citizen-obsessed. He goes on to add, as citizens' needs and desires usurp the budgetary bottom line, government agencies will have to rethink their approach to providing the public with the services and information it needs, which might mean increased investment and reallocation of resources. So before we jump into specific use cases and opportunities, I wanted to first touch on the opportunities for partnerships that differ from some of our other verticals. So beyond technology partners and our issuing banks, we'll need to rethink and reshape our traditional path to market. Urban innovation does not take place in a vacuum, and as such, we'll need to expand our approach to work with the below partners to move the ball forward. So academia, governments and agencies, foundations and think tanks, and community improvement districts or economic councils. We truly believe that the key to achieving measurable change and impact is through open collaboration. Further, it is not as simple as the standard commercial agreement. There are other factors to consider, namely open data and how open data and collaboration models are requisites for success for the smart city of tomorrow. Governments are keen to enter into public-private partnerships to leverage the expertise of the private sector and to employ data-driven approaches. Specifically, public-private partnerships help leverage collective expertise, share the costs, and share the risks. And lastly, it's a much more complex set of stakeholders to consider when trying to innovate in government. So you have zoning boards, you have neighborhood coalitions, you have special interest groups that can all arise to kind of slow down or stifle progress. So we believe the building blocks for technology enablement in smart cities really rests in terms of public and private partnerships. So while cities are working diligently to adapt to meet the challenge of rapid urbanization, they need to help in developing and implementing and scaling solutions. In our conversations to date with both the public and private sectors and general themes we've seen in research, building blocks for tech enablement in smart cities really leverage or rely on how the public-private partnerships are formed and steer us towards recognizing the value that these relationships create. So let's step through it, or at least the thinking behind that statement. At a foundational level, we believe tech and data will unlock new products and service offerings those new service offerings or solutions can often augment existing services and as such should not be viewed as direct competition from a government services point of view. Perfect example is in the mobility space and how, you know, a Lyft or an Uber can actually bring people to the public transit network. And then if we agree on the first two, then we can recognize the final and that is the public private partnerships are integral to enabling new smart city service and business models. So the last few slides have really all been about the run-up. What's changing? What are some themes or trends that are putting pressure on the city environment or ecosystem? But what exactly is a smart city? If you've been following along, you'll note that we have yet to define the smart city. Before defining, let's first think about what are some smart capabilities. So the above graphic provide only a subset of services or capabilities we have identified, such as smart lighting solutions, enabling parking information to be relayed in real time, or smart buildings that can, active, can be actively managed uh, and layer in controls for HVAC or provide information to first responders. And lastly, opportunities around smart mobility and linking various modes of transit. So with that context, at Visa, we've defined the smart city as an urban environment that leverages technology to drive efficiency, raise accountability, and foster a deeper sense of community. Further, the smart city is really a convergence of the civic, public, and private sectors all of which stand to benefit from technologies and capabilities that improve the quality of life. So let's take a look at Barcelona. Over the last decade, Barcelona has demonstrated the value of implementing smart city solutions. They've done so on a couple key pillars. So they wanted to affect social change in public sector innovation. They wanted to foster a more participatory, collaborative, and transparent city. They developed a new, more sustainable and efficient urban model and promote invention, entrepreneurship, and social innovation. So they've been able to implement IoT solutions that ended up saving $58 million on water through smart metering and conservation tactics. They've been able to capture $50 million increase in parking revenues. Smart lighting solutions have saved an additional $37 million. And lastly, and possibly more importantly, it's created 47,000 new jobs to support all of the new infrastructure. And I won't 
you know, belabor, you know, Barcelona too much, but let's take one other example that is called out in the graphic around IoT trash can. And this is perhaps an interesting teaching point on the various levels of IoT deployment from data collection to full-scale automation. So let's picture this. Today, the IoT trash can sends a signal that is full. The location is added automatically to the route, and the driver receives a notification on a dash or via mobile device. But tomorrow, the IoT trash can can send the signal that it's full. The location is added to the route and communicated to an autonomous garbage truck, which may already be out for pickups. And that's kind of thinking through and leveraging real-time data and how that changes kind of the, the function or the business model of the service. So what are some other real-world examples? We're seeing a lot of interest in multimodal transit and that interoperable transit solutions that provide a single point of payment and access to various modalities of, of mobility. Why this is important is it's providing value to both the cardholder um, and all of the other constituents within the, the ecosystem. So it's ease of use for the cardholder, one card on file for all the mobility needs. It provides top of wallet potential for issuers. So if I load my card into that app, I'm likely using that app across all of these modes of transit. Uh, the platform th themselves can actually benefit by kind of sharing the network. So you provide an overlap and there might be some net new consumers. And then lastly, cities run more efficiently. And so the above screenshot is, is from uh, Moveville North America, which launched RideTap in Portland, Oregon. And again, that provided links out to a Lyft or a Car2Go or the Metro, um, all within kind of the TriMet ticketing application. We're also seeing interesting uses of drones, um, not only to possibly move people with some of these VTOL solutions, but also in the last mile or first mile delivery logistics space. Um, the screenshot above is from Daimler-Benz and an e-commerce startup, Saroop, joined forces with Matternet in Zurich to kick off a van-based drone delivery concept. And so they were able to demonstrate that they could do delivery across the various uh, quadrants within Zurich. Um, basically, the concept works that the vans drive around the city, deploy the drone directly to the consumer once they've reached kind of the target neighborhood, and then the drone returns back to the van for um, further fill-ups. And lastly, we're, we're seeing huge potential in artificial intelligence and understanding across the ecosystem and all of our kind of constituents the ability to, to drive kind of artificial intelligence-based solutions to automate various functions and to provide new kind of services to the consumer or to smooth out um, or improve efficiency for the you know, back office functions within businesses and government. So where do we see opportunities for Visa to participate or facilitate in the smart city of the future? Over the last decade, a plethora of services have emerged that focus on how the consumer navigates throughout a city. These services help move people in more efficient ways and are built upon frameworks, networks that are highly adaptable. And further, many of these services will look to automation and autonomy to update existing offerings to define new consumer experiences. As cities evolve, we think secondary opportunities to leverage technology to fundamentally change existing service models will come to market. We believe the IoT ecosystem will be a primary driver behind this change. And some of these opportunities will likely leverage new capabilities with respect to ID and V, and to either initiate a transaction, so governments benefit provisioning through Iris Scan, or complete a transaction, so drone delivery recipient authentication prior to release of goods. Therefore, we project opportunities across logistics, street-level infrastructure, artificial intelligence machine-to-machine, -machine, and government services. So let me walk you through a future vision storyboard. Let's take Susie, and Susie's traveling on business. She wakes up in an Airbnb and accesses her day schedule through a smart home hub. After learning what's on her calendar, she asks, what are my transit options? Hmm, sounds like the neighborhood bike share is just as fast and it looks like a great day outside. She locks one in. In route, while stopped at a traffic light in a dedicated bike lane, Susie is prompted for an offer from a local coffee shop via her mobile phone. Via voice, she confirms her order and receives a confirmation via her smartwatch. After docking her bike near the office, an autonomous delivery van pulls up and extends her coffee and bagel. Susie's day is off to a great start. So IoT helped enable all of those interaction points and provide a seamless experience for Susie from door to door. At Visa, we're standing up and developing APIs and supporting technologies to enable these experiences for Susie and every cardholder. 
During tomorrow's webinar, we'll share some of the specifics, the technical details that enable the above interactions between Susie and her connected urban environment. So given those opportunities, we've identified three key pillars across the smart city of tomorrow. The first is intelligent mobility. So the introduction of new platforms and services will fundamentally change the way a city's inhabitants move about and interact with the city. These opportunities are evolving out of inadequate and capacity-constrained networks of today, the rise of the sharing economy, and various on-demand services. And further, we can see on the horizon all of the opportunities that autonomous electric vehicles will enable. Picking up on that last point, this also relates to how goods move about the city. Previously shared on an overview of the recent drone delivery services, whether by drone or another form of autonomous vehicle, we, how we move goods and fulfill online or automated orders will evolve significantly over the immediate term. Our second pillar is small business solutions. So we, we see opportunities to leverage AI and machine learning to automate various back office capabilities for small businesses. Outside of the office setting, there are additional opportunities to assist small local merchants to drive store traffic, improve the in-store experience, enable customized tailored experiences for the cardholder, leverage new technology to fundamentally redefine the relationship between the consumer and the business. You might ask, why is this city? Well, these small local merchants are integral members of the local community and by extension, the local economy. And then lastly, the third pillar is around government services. So similar to the offerings for small businesses, but with a bit of a twist. So not just the back office, but also how the government will deliver services in the future be it disbursements or receipts, anything from the DMV to trash collection. So I want to close this out by taking a look back at the stakeholders that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. So the civic sector, the private sector, and the public sector. So for the civic sector, how might we improve the quality of life for the city dweller? We want to simplify mobility. What does that mean? We want to support the ecosystem to ensure that payments does not inhibit the release and adoption of multimodal transit schemes. We also want to support contextual commerce, so make it easier for the end consumer to transact, be it in-store or in-app, and support fulfillment activities to ensure that the right goods ultimately find the right recipient. And then lastly, we want to promote financial literacy and inclusion. So we want to leverage data to develop enhanced user profiles to ensure that individuals have access to digital payments and financial services and elevate literacy and financial hygiene. For the private sector, we want to think about how might we leverage technology to enhance how business is conducted in the future. We want to scale process automation. So we want to evolve our products to meet the future needs of businesses that capture and unlock the true value of burgeoning technologies such as AI or machine learning. We want to connect the small businesses, so support small and local merchants to go online and streamline various activities um, and operational processes to level the playing field. And we want to support the future workforce needs. So develop payroll solutions that leverage digital issuance to suit the needs of the gig economy employer and employee. And lastly, for the public sector, how might we improve the functionality and efficiency of the public sector? So we want to drive out inefficiency. So work with governments and agencies to understand where inefficiencies lie in their existing processes and support migration to more efficient, likely digital technology-driven solutions. We want to be the missing link, so help facilitate conversations between our traditional partners, large and small, and the public sector to better serve constituents. And we want to support open data models, so promote opportunities to share data and collaborate across public and private sectors to solve the challenges of tomorrow. So with that, I wanted to thank everyone for their time today. And it's just the beginning. Let's build the future of commerce together. Thanks again, and be sure to check out other Visa Developer Platform webinars through the Visa Developer Platform. Thanks.